Um, the topic of my talk is all of us. It's collective intelligence, creative swarms, and what we can learn from us. And I would like to start uh, my presentation with a short video. Okay, so I think what you have seen here is an amazing example of collaboration. And the topic of my talk really is also collaboration, swarm creativity, and how those patterns of creative swarms really look like. Because if we have figured out those patterns, then we can try to understand them early on in the process, before the swarm is as big as Google, so basically Google in the garage, and if we see the four inventors in the garage and we can already predict that they will be the next Google, then that's the sort of predictive analytics that we are able to understand. So to put it in other words, with our methods, reading the collective mind on the internet mostly, we can never predict the next earthquake. But what we can predict is whether large groups of people think there will be an earthquake. We also cannot predict whether Roger Federer will win a tennis tournament, because that doesn't depend on the crowd. That depends on one single person, Roger Federer. But we can predict whether large groups of people think that Roger Federer wins, and it turns out large groups of people are right surprisingly many times. And to prove that, I would now like to use our wonderful voting device. And um, I'm trying to trick it a little bit, so we will see how well that works. So um, this here is um, a hypothetical example. We have here this large pot of sugus. And I'm asking each one of you to guess how many there are in here. And then we will see how close to truth the collective intelligence will be. So just look at it. Think, and we can only give you um, four numbers. And do we have the numbers somewhere? You have those, three, those four options, 250, 270, 300, 400. Which ones do you think it is? Okay, so now we have 75. I have to change that. And then the percentages are 17. Then we have 270. Then we have, uh, no, 40, 17, 20, 43. 24. And 16. Oh, okay. Okay, so I think I messed it up. That's when I'm trying to do things on stage, then <laughs> they go wrong. That's, one should not do those things. So is that correct? I don't think it's correct. I think it's E here. No? So what did I do wrong? Uh, yeah. This one? Just copy the sound. Copy. 
there. And now it's E. Is that correct? Or am I doing something wrong? Seventeen B is forty-three, C is twenty-four. Well, I have to say the collective intelligence was not that accurate because it's three hundred thirty-four. So not bad. But um, I, I think it, it sort of works. We haven't given you on purpose the right solution, but um, you are still quite close. So um, ideally, we would take all the, each of you would give a single number and then we would take the mean and usually that gets you really close. There are always some people which are even closer and that's the experts, but the collective intelligence usually is at least as good as the experts. So I think that was just an illustration and you also saw that the collective intelligence of the audience here was able to sort out my uh, clumsiness with Excel, so that was another proof of small swarm intelligence. Now back to the social networks, because what I would like to um, introduce you first is the way of how we are measuring the collective intelligence of people. And the bottom line is it's all about relationships, and it's all about all of us. And in the age of Facebook, Twitter, and so on, I guess social networks, that's a term that everybody is very familiar with. But it turns out not everybody is equal in a social network. And usually, it's not the people you think of that might be the most important ones, but it's the hidden leaders. And if we find those hidden leaders before they become famous, then we have found the people we have to watch to predict what is going to happen next. And this example of a social network that you see here, um, it's actually a network of jazz musicians, um, illustrates that there are two ways of measuring the importance of people in networks. It's the number of friends and how important your friends are. And to um, understand how this works. Um, I grew up in a small town in Canton Aargau called Oberentfelden. And um, hypothetical example, I'm not in the soccer club. I was not in the soccer club, but if I were in the soccer club of Oberentfelden, then I would have many friends. But chances are um, they wouldn't really help me to change the world with Barack Obama. But still, I would have some impact. Let's say I would have those 100 friends and if I tell something, it will reach all of them. So this is called my degree, the number of friends. But on the other hand, if, like Steve Coleman on this picture, I have only two real friends, but they are very important. Let's say one of them is called Barack Obama, the other one is called Bill Gates, that's enough. And if I'm between those two, if I'm connecting those two important people, this is called betweenness in social network language, that makes me really important. And what we do when we measure those social networks, and those social networks can really be anything from Twitter networks, um, I guess you know who the most important people um, in the Twitter sphere are. Any guesses? Unfortunately not. Justin Bieber, by far. And close second, Lady Gaga. So um, those people, they are real influencers. And how do we know this? Well, I will come to that a little bit later on. Based on the, how quickly they are picked up, how much they are retweeted, and so on. So there is an entire series of metrics that we are measuring to measure the importance on Twitter or on Facebook. 
Uh, in Facebook, there is the, the logic is very different from Twitter, but again, you have very um, influential people. Um, just to give away another little secret, usually it's pretty girls in their twin 20s, and they have lots of friends, and if they something posted on their wall, it's picked up by many other people. So those people, if we see what they say, for example, about who will win the next Oscar, who will, um, what brand, they are going to buy, that's a very high chance that those things actually will be happening. So it's this sort of social network analysis that we do by constructing the networks on Facebook, on Twitter, on Wikipedia, on the web at large, but also in companies where we ask CEOs or employees with whom of your competitors are you exchanging knowledge, are you communicating, and that allows us to construct precisely the same network. So the network picture always looks the same as here, but the meaning of the connection between two people can be very different. It can be friendship, it can be playing football together, it can be playing in the same jazz band, but it can also be a business relationship, or it can be going to the same school. Anyway, that's basically all I think you need to know for this presentation about social network analysis. Now we are using this to find the patterns of the most creative people. And in order to understand how this works, I would like to tell you a story um, from my own earlier life. Um, I started in Switzerland at the University of Zurich, and then I went to MIT as a postdoc. I had um, what I did, what people are doing there. I wrote academic papers, and I went to a conference. It was a conference about hypertext in 1991 in San Antonio in Texas, where I presented my paper, and I also dragged around my Macintosh, which at that time was not as small as this one, but it was huge and clunky, because I wanted to demo my system. And then there came this little man here. Um, I don't know whether anybody of you knows who that person is. Did I hear Tim Berners-Lee? Yes, I was expecting in this crowd of computer geeks, a few people should know him. Anyway, at that time, nobody knew who he was. And uh, he came and he asked me whether he could put up some flyers at my booth, because he had also submitted a paper which unfortunately was turned down. His system was called the World Wide Web, and the program committee had thought it was a stupid idea. It was non-academic, it had no merit, but he didn't care. He just came, he brought his flyers, he pressed them into everybody's hand, whether they liked it or not. He organized a ses special session during lunch where he was trying to recruit other people to join him and develop his World Wide Web further. And at the end of the conference, he succeeded in recruiting a half a dozen or so of postdocs and graduate students, and together they went on and further developed um, the web, HTML, the first um, uh, browsers, which um, at that time they ran on a very special hardware, uh, the Next, um, which I think most of, some of you might be old enough to remember it. It was sort of a geek's um, uh, machine, really beautiful, but a brand, brainchild of Steve Jobs, it never really took off. Um, he was also able to convince my boss at that time. I was at the Advanced Networking Architecture Group at MIT. My boss was David Clark, who was leading the Internet Engineering Task Force, and Tim Berners-Lee convinced him to be accepted as a visiting scientist, which meant he didn't have an office. He only had a desk in the hallway, and he had the oldest and clunkiest computer, but he was doing his convincing, his recruiting, he was sending out email to many other people and telling them how great his system was and recruiting more, even more people. And at that time, it started to dawn on me that this really might be a good idea. And so I was, um, when the first World Wide Web conference was announced in Geneva at CERN, because that's where Tim Berners-Lee worked, he, um, I wanted to go there also, but I could not, because they were expecting 80 people. The largest room 
was um, capable of um, uh, taking in 300 people and just about 500 had registered. So at that time, it became obvious that this cool idea really might become a new trend. And then there came another gentleman named Mark Andreessen who wrote a browser called Mosaic and then it really took off. And by now it has changed our lives like very few other inventions in the past. And this is the pattern of swarm creativity and that's the pattern that I'm looking for that I have been analyzing for the last 10 years in all sorts of electronic networks. Email networks, face-to-face -face networks, I will come to that where we have, we also have our batch, it's, um, uh, it has a, 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 a wrapping box, so you don't see the hardware so nicely as this, the one that you have, and it measures face-to-face -face interaction. It measures whether you look into each other's eyes, it measures whether you are excited or whether you are bored, because it has an accelerometer, and so if I hop around, then I'm happy and excited. It also measures the pitch of my voice, whether I fall asleep or whether I'm really excited and my voice goes up and down. And it also measures whether I get close to you or whether I'm sort of more withdrawn. And measuring those face-to-face -face signals allows to predict amazing things. And more about those amazing things later on. And then, of course, on the very large scale, the web is the best predictor of all for um, things like stock trends, movie trends, and so on. More about that also. But this is the pattern of swarm creativity, and that's the pattern that we are looking for in individuals, in organizations, and globally. So first, we have somebody with a really creative idea, and this somebody does, and that's why you see the bee background, a waggle dance like the bees do, and I like the bees as a metaphor because this is a very um, repeatable um, uh, pattern for the bees, meaning that once this waggle dance pattern of the bees, where they tell each other how to find honey, had been understood, it became very easy to read at the large scale. You couldn't really predict what an individual bee would be doing, but you could predict what an entire swarm of bees would be doing. And the same is true for us. We cannot predict what an individual person is doing, but we can very well predict how large groups of people are reacting. We have the Tim Berners-Lee, the creators, intrinsically motivated, and they do their waggle dance. They re recruit what I call the coin the collaborative innovation network. And that's really the phase where the pattern becomes observable. So cool hunting, looking for those patterns of creative people means looking for coins. And those coins, usually it's like five to 15 people. They build the prototype. They build the first version of the web. They recruit their friends and family, and that's what I call the CLN, or Collaborative Learning Network. And that's around 150 people. And they are the early testing, um, the, test, the beta testers, so to speak. And some of them join the coin and develop the product further. Others go out and tell how wonderful it is, until thousands of people in what I call the Collaborative Interest Network, or CIN, accept it. And that's the point when the new idea sticks, where it gets over the tipping point. And this four-step process, creator, coin, learning network, interest network, that's what we are trying to find. So the question now is, how can we find the creators in electronic networks, how can we find the coin members? It turns out they communicate in a certain way. And I discovered that actually studying Tim Berners-Lee because as you might know, he's also at MIT. He's in the World Wide Web Consortium. He has his email archive all public online on the web because 
he believes in sharing and so he shares his information and that's actually, it turns out, one of the key points. And so people like Tim Berners-Lee and those other collaborative innovators, they are different in three typical ways. First, they are very well connected. Tim Berners-Lee was well connected, otherwise he couldn't have gone to the ACM Hypertext Conference, otherwise David Clark wouldn't have invited him to come to MIT. So they have, as we just learned in social network analysis, high degree centrality, high betweenness centrality, they don't know many people, they know important people. Secondly, Tim, uh, today he's not so responsive anymore, but I guess he has millions of people that want something from Sir Tim Berners-Lee. But um, in the early days, when you sent him an email, 30 seconds later he would respond. So just, I call that degree of interactivity. Those people are very responsive. And that's something which is very measurable. And when we look in our coins for those creators, and if we have our email archives, those are two things which we can extract automatically using graph theory and between us and degree, that's, um, if you have a computer science background, it's extremely well-defined networking metrics. And um, looking at the average response time in email, that's something that you can also easily do. And then the third thing, sharing. Sharing, if you have the contents of Facebook pages, tweets, or email, you can see how many common words people are using how many new common words they are inventing. So the more distinct they are from the rest of the crowd, and the more unique the words, the new abbreviations, the new acronyms, like World Wide Web, HTML, RDF, and so on, all those things that the innovation crowd is inventing, the more they have, the more they are a new coin. So those things, high connectivity, high interactivity, high degree of sharing, they are the distinctive characteristics and with our systems we can get those things out automatically. Networks of people that work together as coins, they do not look like a star, but they look like a diamond or they have those crystal structure where everybody is connected with everybody. And we have studied hundreds of projects and networks in the meantime and it, this is an, by now a very established science called social network analysis which is a combination of sociology, um, um, graph theory, statistics, mathematics, computer science, complexity theory and so on and the finding has been consistent for innovation tasks it's much better if you have to put it in simple words, democracy, where everybody talks to everybody and that's what the picture up here shows you. And if you have hierarchy, if you have one guy like number 65 here in the center, that is not good for creation tasks. It turns out it's good for high production tasks. We did, for example, one project where we had nurses in a hospital wear those patches um, actually, this is the brand new version, so they were wearing a, an older version where the batches were black, but this doesn't matter. And what we found is that patients recover quickly if nurses are managed hierarchically and centrally. What we studied is a room um, after, it was a really huge hospital in Boston, and they have 50 operating rooms, so it's really huge and then they wheel out the patients after the operations into a room perhaps almost the size of this room here which is called the wake up room or in medical terms post anesthesia care unit and what we found is that on those days where you had the hierarchy um, as measured with those patches the patients would recover faster we found some other really surprising things which are counter medical wisdom. For example, what we found is that the more nurses stood around a bed of a patient, the faster the patient recovered. 
Just the sheer presence of human beings having close to others makes us recover quickly. And that's actually the opposite of what nurses learn when they go to nursing school, because they are taught to leave the patient alone. But there was an even more amazing thing, and that is that nurses can predict the future, meaning that their speech pattern, their energy pattern, and the way how close they get to the patients predicts how fast a patient recovers. This means, even if we don't know it, we somehow feel how, in, how good or how bad a shape a patient is. And this reflects in our batches, which means basically we could just equip all the nurses or all the employees in a hospital with these batches and then we would know how quickly we will be, will be uh, well again. But so far, we haven't really done that project. But just to tell you that you really can study amazing things. Now, um, and that also coin is good for innovation, but not really in a high pressure hospital environment, where sometimes hierarchical environment is better. As far as coins go, the question is how does this pattern look like? And here I have my other favorite example besides uh, Tim Berners-Lee, um, Linux. And I don't think I have to say anything about Linux in this environment. I would expect that everybody knows the story. So I will just tell that about the same time that Tim Berners-Lee went to San Antonio to do his waggle dance, Linus Torvalds did his waggle dance. But his waggle dance was even more primitive because he just sent out an email saying, I just created a little system. It's nothing special. Feel free to download, try it out on your own computer, but please, if you make changes, send them back to me, and I will incorporate them for everybody else to share. And that was enough to get his coin off the ground. It took about the same amount of time, one year, to get Linux, the community, the brand, and so on, established. And the reason why I think Linus is even more amazing than Tim is that Linus had zero funding. Tim, at least, CERN paid his trip to San Antonio to do his waggle dance face to face and recruit other people. Linus, the only thing he could do is share his ideas and incorporate them and give back to the community, and that worked unbelievably well. So we have this coin of the core kernel maintainers. We have the learning network of the people in the different distributions that took the original sources and developed them further. And then we had the people that were just the end users hanging out on Slashdot or whatever else on the web. But it's always the same structure. We have the coin, then that spreads out to the learning network, spreads out to the interest network. You could think of like throwing a pebble into the water, and then you see those concentric circles spreading out. And it's always about the same numbers, 15, 150, 1,500. And why is that so? There is something called Dunbar's number. Robin Dunbar, he's an anthropologist at the University of Oxford, and he has studied the amount of very close next of kin, of family and so on, that we can manage. And it turns out the human brain seems to be the most capable of managing up to 15 close friends. The tribe is about 150. And it seems we can distinguish plus minus 1,500 different faces, meaning we know the name and the face. That's based on his research. This is also Facebook is integrating that into their uh, system. So we have our, our um, um, family or our close friends. We have the tribe. And the army has also reflected that because you have the same unit. You have the platoon, 15. You have the company, 150. And then you have the next bigger size, about 1,500. And the same thing in the virtual world. And we have studied how well it does you if 
you have 5,000 friends in Facebook or in Xing or in LinkedIn and just to take away the answer, it really doesn't help you much. It's nice and some people use that as a game to collect many friends, but what we did, we measured success of startups and compared that with the number of friends in Xing and this is actually negatively correlated. So don't waste your time amassing large numbers of friends in Xing. It doesn't really help you, except if you are part of the elite. So if you are a Harvard alumni, or if you are, perhaps I should, I'm not sure whether that's too, I'm not from the ETH, so I can perhaps bring that example if you are an ETH, because um, alumni, I just noticed that when I'm in the US, they are really proud of being from the ETH or from MIT, whatever, of the small group, if you network inside that group, and if you have many friends inside that group, then there is very strong correlation with business success. So you need to have the high between us friends. So um, this is the pattern, and here you see an example from my own life. At one time, I was a partner with Deloitte Consulting and we were innovators also. We were creating um, new products in consulting, which means PowerPoint slide decks. But um, you nevertheless see the five of us in the core and that is based on my own mailbox and the mailbox of two of my friends that we just load it into our tool and then we saw how the networks developed and so we have the coin and then you see the learning network which for our example was the marketing teams of Deloitte consulting all across Europe. We had offices in 18 countries so there was a marketing team in each of those countries and they took our initial slide decks and converted them into glossy brochures and that's what you see here and then this spreads out even further and if you watch such a movie and this movie here, this is just three snapshots of a movie, this looks like fireworks and you see how the coin extends into the learning network, extends into all those little rockets going off at the periphery and so you can really measure very well how these things develop and the question is what does this mean for you? How can you be a creative member of a coin? And I have here a very simple insight based on many mailboxes from my students. Don't be a star, be a galaxy. If you share your social capital, if you um, are embedded into galaxies of other people, that is a great predictor of success. And it turns out you can do all of those things automatically by measuring between a centrality and degree centrality and how they change over time and that will predict how much of a galaxy and how much of a collaborative innovator you are. So that's the basic insight of coins and now the question is how can we look for those coins on the web or other electronic archives and that's what I call cool hunting and one of the insights in cool hunting really is that not everybody is equal and in particular we have three categories of people and to explain how they are different um, let's just look at an example um, I was in Paris a few years ago with my children and we were cool hunting for the best restaurant the first day we followed the wisdom of the crowd which took us to Montmartre which means we followed the tourist masses which means it was okay food, but it was pricey. And so that the wisdom of the crowd, it's the baseline, but it doesn't get you very far. Next day, we asked the expert, the concierge, and I'm sure he got some commission, but he sent us to a really nice restaurant, but it was very expensive. So the third day, we followed the swarm. The swarm, that's the local, and that got us to a cheap restaurant but only cheap money-wise, the quality was very good. And so the wisdom of the swarm, that's the best. And cool hunting really means combining 
the wisdom of the crowd, the wisdom of the swarm, and the wisdom of the expert. And each of them has their own semantics and their own particularities. Particularly the experts have a huge problem. Experts want to sell themselves. So that means they um, are right 50% of the time, and you never know in what 50% you are. But there is a trick. And we found that out when we predicted movie success. If we look at um, online forums, there is something called IMDB, Internet Movie Database. There is another one called Rotten Tomatoes, which is only for experts. And look at the positivity of the language. If an expert says, this is the best movie I have ever seen, and let's say he says that for Slumdog Millionaire, the movie will be wonderful. If the expert says, this is the worst movie I have ever seen, and let's say he says that for Slumdog Millionaire, the movie will be wonderful. If the expert says, this movie is not particularly good, or this is a fine movie, and if you have nothing better you do, you can go and see it, it will be not very successful. To put it in other words, emotions. If you have positive emotions or negative emotions, that predicts success. And that's the trick of combining those um, signals together. So cool hunting means we have people, we measure their between the centrality and their degree centrality. We look what they are saying. We trace that over time, how positive or negative they are talking. And that will predict us amazing things. And here I have a list of some cool hunts that we have been doing over the last 10 years, from the world level, over the organizational level, down to the individual level. And if we look at the world level, I already spoke about the movies, so I'm not saying much. We construct social networks of the swarm in IMDb on the Frozen Tomatoes. And then we are able to predict on the day the movie comes out, up to 95% accurate, how much money the movie will be making over the next four weeks. And this is just some examples of cool hunting. We actually did that for um, uh, SFDRS for Einstein uh, a year ago, where we predicted the Oscars. It turns out we were right for the directors and the movies. We were not very good for the actors. The problem is actors have a life, a meaning the discussion might be about them winning the Oscar, but it might also be about their love life and their breakups and all of those things. So it's not, you need to know what you are doing. It's quite tricky. We also look at Twitter and what we can do there. If we look for hope, fear, and worry, then we are able, just doing it like that, to predict one day ahead with 70% accuracy whether Nasdaq, Dow Jones, or S&P goes up or down. If we measure um, a factor in the importance of the people, the retweet rate, we get up to 70 to 80%. If there were no Justin Bieber, Justin Bieber messes up our system. <laughs> because you have too many people that say, or actually young girls, uh, I, uh, and I fear that Justin doesn't love me. I hope I see Justin, and so on. So this hope, fear, and worry thing gets messed up by the love life because teenagers have no private life anymore, it seems. And so they will tweet everything and that messes up our stock predictions. We also looked at company networks and one noteworthy project we did in Israel. We, in 1997, we asked the CEOs of 100 companies with whom of your competitors do you speak? And then, seven years later, we looked which of those companies were still around. And so we got the social network, something like that. It turns out that the discussion network of 1997 predicts seven years into the future the company success. And the best predictor was the ones that refused to answer our questions, 90% went out of business. And I love to tell that story when I recruit new sponsors for our work. <laughs> but the point is more deep because if you are interested in other things than just your core business, that's good for your long-term survival. It also turns out the more you speak with your competitors, the more success you have. So the knowledge sharing thing even applies for 
startups. So that's one of our examples. We repeated the same with Boston Biotech startups in Massachusetts. I'm not going into great detail. And as far as individual things go, and I thought that would be interesting for this group here, we looked at Eclipse developers and we measured their productivity and their creativity. Productivity in this case means efficiency in fixing bugs. Creativity means adding new features. It turns out programmers are either productive or creative, but not both. They are negatively correlated. You can only be creative or productive. We were interested in the creativity. Creativity is predicted by oscillation in between a centrality, meaning if you go, your pattern goes back between hierarchy, democracy, hierarchy, democracy, that is creativity. If your pattern is always the same, always hierarchy or always democracy, that is productivity. You are good in fixing bugs, but you are not so good in inventing new features. So that's some of our secrets of predicting the future. There is many more. I already spoke about the sociometric patches where we um, looked, and this is just the older version. This one is the new version, um, where we can look at individual creativity. Um, now, from this technical um, presentation, I would like to come back to what does this mean for you? What can you do to be a collaborative and creative leader? And for that, I would like to give the word to a presenter at TED. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter Gore. Are there any questions from the audience? No? No one? 
Thank you very much. We'll see you again on the podium this afternoon. We're looking forward to it. Thank you very much.